it's extremely hard for phones to communicate because the electromagnetic spectrum is a giant mess. There are a lot of phones, a lot of radio stations, a lot of Wi-Fi networks, a lot of navigation and a lot of things that don't even try to communicate like your microwave and they all use the same electromagnetic spectrum. Depending on your position, the signals that you're not interested in can actually be thousands of times stronger than the signals that you actually want to listen to. This is actually such a big problem that signal processing takes up about a quarter of your phone's motherboard. And it's all made possible by these little things. But before I explain you the brilliantly simple design, we have to know what we want to listen to. What do we want to get out of this noise? I always learned that digital devices use on and off for their ones and zeros. And for communication this would have meant that their waves would look something like this. On, on, off, 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 on, on, off, 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 on, off. But that's not actually how they usually transmit ones and zeros. What happens most often is that there are two carrier waves which are just a sine wave and a cosine wave at a specific frequency. They get combined and sent out. Note that the period after which this wave repeats itself is still the same. It has the same wavelength. This is important for later. At the receiver, we can separate the sine and cosine again with some math, and we can use their relative amplitude and phase as coordinates to find a certain set of ones and zeros from a lookup table. However, this only works if we can manage to listen to a small frequency band while ignoring all the others. And that's what this little device is for. It's a filter that only lets certain frequencies through. And because you need a few frequency bands for Wi-Fi, a few frequency bands for cellular data, a few frequency bands for Bluetooth, and blah blah blah, you need a lot of these filters. And most of them are based on the same principle. We have two sets of interlocking forks on a piece of quartz. And that's it, actually. That's the whole device. Let me explain how it works. The incoming signal is a seemingly random wave because it's made out of all sorts of wavelengths. This noisy signal is put through one set of interlocking forks that are mounted on a piezoelectric crystal, which means that when an electric field is applied, it shrinks or expands depending on the direction of the field and the orientation of the crystal. Basically, when an electric signal comes in, it creates a physical wave, in this case a surface acoustic wave that moves a lot like the waves you see on water, but just tiny and really fast. It's also where this little fella gets his name from, a saw filter. Anyway, on the other side of the crystal, it's picked back up again by a similar set of forks because it also works the other way around. When a piezoelectric material is compressed or stretched, it creates a voltage across it. So, how does this filter? Well, with one tine on our forks, we would just recreate the incoming wave. However, we have many tines that are spaced out at the exact wavelength that we want to listen to. Literally the length of the wave when it travels through this material. The fork splits up the signal into many weaker signals that create many weak waves. And because the tines are exactly one wavelength apart of the frequency that we want to listen to, the next wave from that frequency comes in at the exact moment we reach the next tine. So they get doubled up again and again, while waves of different lengths don't get amplified or even counteract themselves. So this noisy signal, that's a combination of all these different wavelengths, becomes cleaner and cleaner. And on the other side, the same happens again. A voltage is created between these tines by the deformation of the material, but if it's the right wavelength, the same voltage is created between all the other tines too. By changing the spacing, you can determine the wavelength you want to listen to. And by choosing the amount of tines, you can make a trade-off between precision and delay. Because as you can imagine, if you have more tines, the wave needs to fit better and better to create constructive interference over the whole fork. So you can listen to a smaller band of the spectrum, but it takes longer for the wave from the backmost tine to reach the frontmost tine, and more waves get mixed. Remember that one wave gets amplified with the next wave. This means that the changes in amplitude, for example, will be less sharp if you have more tines. And eventually, that means that you need more waves for a single set of ones and zeros, which means less data per second. So you want just enough tines to create a clear signal, but not too much more. Now, before I explain what we see in this picture, I would like to inform you about the existence of Mint Mobile, the partner of this video. They are a mobile service provider in the US, and they would love for you to know that they exist. They have a current offer with various discounts. If you use my link to sign up, they will know that I told you about their existence. Alright, what is this thing? Well, I couldn't quickly find a real picture of the insides of a soft filter online, so I did what every fun person would do. Instead of searching better, I tried to take some pictures myself. 
I cracked open an old phone I had laying around, taped its camera lens to my current phone to create a DIY microscope and went to town on the motherboard. First I tried sanding the whole thing down in the hope I would come across the forks, but after a while I noticed that was not going to work for various reasons. Eventually I found the best success by cracking some of the chips open. These chips, of which I was only moderately sure that they were saw filters, kept breaking at the wrong layer, or so I thought, because they just don't look anything like I expected from the theory. Even this one that has what looks like interlocking forks has them in all sorts of uneven sizes without symmetry, so eventually I just kinda gave up because I broke all the filters on the board. I started googling again when I found this picture from System Plus Consulting. It's from an analysis and comparison they did on a few saw filters. And would you look at that? This one has the exact same layout as the one I pictured, and this one too. I actually found saw filters. But the forks don't go like this as it looks in my picture. No, they go like this. And they are just so incredibly tiny that you can't see them at all. We are only seeing the rows of electrodes in my picture. So why does this one filter have so many rows of different sizes? Well, that's because when you actually design components of this size in the real world and you want to get every last bit of performance out of them, you have to worry about the fact that waves travel in all directions, and about imperfections, and about reflections, and about... Well, let's just say that for actual engineers, things get a little bit less brilliantly simple. I hope to see you in the next video.